have joined us here at Southern Crescent to worship with us, if you would please stand as we sing, I'm Alive in You. Good morning, church. It is great to be with you this morning. We are excited to be back from camp. And so first, let me just say thank you for those who prayed for us. Uh, the things that we saw God do were just so phenomenal, at least from my part and I think from these students' part. And it is a large part simply because we believe that God moved and we believe in the power of prayer. And so you joining us in that was so, so powerful. And so we are grateful for that. As we start this morning, I got a number of students or two students who want to share, and then I'm going to read some testimony from some of the others. But we want to do this simply to encourage you to let you know that camp is not just simply about the fun and the games and the water park and splashing in the holes and all, wrestling and all that fun stuff. But God uses all of that to change lives and to change hearts. So first coming is uh, Mr. Caden Barnes. Oh, look at that. You got a round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Um, before I begin, I just want to say 
If I do sound a little bit weird, it is because <laughs> I'm missing my tooth. <laughs> so sorry if it, that's a little bit weird, but I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, this week has been an incredible week, and it's been an incredible opportunity to be with my church family and to have time alone with God. What I learned really this week was how we need to stay close to God during trials and tribulations. And another thing I learned was that God calls us to give him everything. As a Christian, we owe God everything. And that week, um, the Lord was just calling me to give him something that I don't even know why I was holding on to. And it was all the anger, grief, and sorrow, and sadness, and sin I had felt since I lost my dad. I don't know why I held on to it, but he, he, God was calling that, and I was holding it from him. And he, he called me that Wednesday night, and he said, Caden, give me all of that. I don't know why you're holding it, but give it to me. And that night, I fell on my knees, and I gave it to the Lord. And I stood up, and I felt so alive and so freed from that pain that I'd felt for six months. <laughs> it was amazing. And I stand here today because... God freed me and awoken me from this deep slumber of grief and sorrow and sadness and all of that. And I just want to bring it back to you guys and tell you that God can do anything. Our God is a great God. He can take it all. Give it to him. It's amazing. I just thank you all for just helping us have this amazing opportunity to go down to St. Simon's and just be the Lord. Thank you, guys. Okay. What I learned this week was how weak my faith was and how I was just going through the motions. And I really just made decisions based on how it would make me feel. What I learned is what is that I want to increase my faith and trust in him to be able to teach others and so they can experience the joy and the experiences that I have. And but to do that I have to mature my faith first and grow in my taproot. That's what we learned there. I'm gonna read more, memorize the word, and I'm gonna spend more time with him. In short, I'm gonna ask him to prune the things that strap me from God. And I'm gonna start doing more quiet times because those are very important too. I mean, we could give the invitation right now, probably, and I think we're okay. But I want to read you just a couple more from a number of the students, uh, just, again, so you can hear their testimonies. Uh, from Addison Houseworth, she said, One thing I learned from youth camp was how my dad, that's me, said how we can see an apple. When we see an apple, you know it came from an apple tree. Or when you see an apple tree, you know it obviously will produce apples. Just like how, as Christians, our actions and how we react to things should reflect Christ. Because John 15, 1 through 8 tells us God is the gardener, Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches, and our purpose is to produce fruit. Jake Buckholt said, what I learned at youth camp last week, I learned how to do a quiet time. I learned how to interact and talk with God during those quiet times, and also learned how to be rooted in Christ. Amelia Smith said, I learned that in order to stay rooted in faith, we have to push away certain things from our lives that may be prohibiting us from growing closer in our faith. Those things could be bad habits, addictions to social media, or other sins that Satan is trying to drive into our hearts. I learned that what God is teaching is more important, and that letting things go and will that letting things go is and will be so worth it. Staying rooted also includes having friends who are rooted in faith as well, because some trees can't stand without the roots of others. Philip Newton said, We must be rooted in Christ so that when you go through a tough time you don't follow the world and you stay in God's word. And I also learned that you can't just add Christ to your life. Your life has to be Christ. Daniel Ruiz said, I learned a lot at Youth Camp 22, but these are the top three. Number one, I learned that it is very important to grow and stay rooted in my faith with Jesus now while I am still young, so that when I grow up and have to face the world, I'll be strong in my faith and will not fall into sin and temptation. Number two, I was taught how to become a man. Being a man is not just growing up and moving away from your family, but it is to live for God. What I mean by that, it is to always to help those when needs arise, to be responsible by obeying God's word and doing his work by helping out and sharing his word. Also to lead courageously and take charge when a leader is needed. 
Lastly, I learned that sometimes you have to let some of your friends go if all they're doing is tearing you down, making you fall in temptation and telling you to act against God's will. Levi Houseworth said, This is what I learned at camp. I learned what it means to be rooted in Christ and to build your foundation on stable ground so that in the real world, when a wave of evil comes, it won't wash you away with your relationship with him. And then Kyla Perry said, We couldn't have a better week. This week for us was called Rooted. It was all about having our faith rooted so when the storms come, it won't cause us to fall over and make our branches fall. We must have God as our taproot, which is the most important thing. We must set our hearts on things above. We also have to ask ourselves, what are our passions and our priorities in this life? God's Son bought your body on Calvary's cross. Stay focused on Him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. We don't need a loss of focus. God is the gardener, and Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. Produce the fruit to grow God's kingdom. My favorite part of camp was night three of camp, and everyone in that place was simply moved. The Holy Spirit was in that place, and everyone felt it. There were no dry eyes. And I want every day for our lives to be like that. Thank you all for everyone who prayed for us this week. And I'm sure there's many others that students could have voiced, and especially from Sunrise as well. I know we had a couple of salvations and a number of rededications and just things that students were able just simply to let go of. And so I just want you to know that when you tithe and when you give to the ministries of this church and when you give to even VBS, it, yes, we have fun in everything. Because if you can't have fun being a Christian, then you don't know what being a Christian is about. But we also do things to teach these kids and these students about God's glory and God's love and, and use that to help shape them. And so we take very seriously just every dime that you give to be able to pour into and invest in these kids. And so thank you so much for that. And I hope that's simply an encouragement to you. If you were a guest with us this morning or a guest online, again, we welcome you and we thank you for being here. It is great to be in the house of the Lord as we worship together and just honor this great God who loves us so very much gave his life for us. And so we want to honor him and just lift our voices high, and we want to come to him in prayer right now and just thank him for this great day. So would you join me as we pray? Father, I am grateful. I am so grateful for this church that loves students and loves kids and loves these adults. God, I'm thankful for the faithfulness of all who are here as they continue to tithe and to give and to help us meet our budget, not because we're consumed or worried about money, but simply because you call us to, to meet needs. And so we use that as faithful as we can to plan trips and do activities and do VBS and to to give benevolence to those who need it and every other aspect that comes along. And so, God, I just thank you that we are a part of that. God, I thank you for what you did at camp, and I thank you for the leaders who went. I thank you for these students who went, and I thank you for a church that supported us. And for these decisions that have been made and the things that you have taught our students, may we continue to, to simply be the light in everywhere that we go and everything that we do, that we would produce the fruit of Christ. And Father, for this day right now that we have to be gathered together as we sing with this wonderful praise band behind us, for every person who is here, we want to lift high the name of Jesus. We want to lift our hands in, in praise. We want to lift our voices in prayer. And we want to honor you and ask that you would continue to speak. The same way you spoke to the students at camp, you can speak to our hearts this day. And so find us open. Find us willing to listen, willing to respond, willing to change our lives in honor to honor, honor you. So God, thank you. Thank you for this day and for every person who is here. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now would you stand as we continue to worship together.
going to be honest. It's hard to come up after that youth testimony. Um, that was hard. Um, but I want to say to that, um, even though we did have a tragic event that happened to our family, everyone here is going to face something in your life. You are going to face a hurdle. You're going to face a tragedy. You are going to face a struggle. But I want you to know, and we've heard testimony this morning, that our God is greater he gives us hope when there is none. He gives us strength. He releases us from chains and from bonds and from bitterness. He is the one we are here this morning to worship. Amen. It is not, I say, it is never about us. It's about our Heavenly Father. And we're going to sing that name this morning in this song, Jesus. We're going to sing that over and over again. And my prayer is that you would lift his name on high, that you wouldn't worry about the people next to you or in front of you or behind you if they're singing off key. Who cares, right? Um, we're here to worship the one who is above all, the one who is in all, the one who is through all, the one that can heal, the one that can save. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord, most high. Your hidden glory in creation is now revealed. beautiful name it is. 
What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven. It's been a great day already, amen. Um, just to hear those students, be it through the written word or spoken, um, to share their testimony, but also just to speak truth. And I'm just so grateful. That's what we prayed for, isn't it? That God would work in their lives. And so we're thankful for answered prayer. And um, we're just blessed. And uh, we thank you, House, for all the work you put in. Um, wherever you are, there you are. Thank you so much. Scientists have um, studied the conciliatory 
or the peacemaking behavior of different kinds of animals. And a lot of the research has been on primates like gorillas and chimpanzees. And, and what they found is that they often follow confrontation with some sort of reconciling behavior, some sort of friendly behavior afterward, be it a, a hug or um, some embrace or a kiss. They, and they, they've seen that pattern. They've seen the same pattern in other animals as well. They've seen it in goats. They've seen it in hyenas and, and all of these studies. And there is only one species so far that has failed to show any outward sign of reconciliation. And that's the domestic cat. Surprise, surprise. Last week we began a series entitled, Jesus, I Have a Question. And we saw, or we looked last week at the, a question of faith as John the Baptist in prison asked Jesus, are you the coming one or is there another that we should be looking for? Today, um, another question I want us to look at is a question of forgiveness, a question of forgiveness. So I'm going to ask if you would to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18. We know that we can't live in this world very long without somebody hurting us in one way or the other, right? I mean, if I were to ask who has been hurt by somebody in the past, probably everybody's hand here would go up, right? We've all been wronged. Um, and, and truth is, at one time or another, we've all wronged somebody. Um, and it's hard to say, I'm sorry. But it's even harder, I think, to say you're forgiven, right? And it, it hurts so badly to think, for me at least, and, and it just hurts to see that we increasingly seem to have, are, are becoming a, a, a grudge-oriented society. Um, so much so that forgiveness um, no longer seems to be a virtue um, in our world. And, and so um, I, I'm just afraid that we become a society of cats. And, and, and I really, I'm going to tell you, I, I thought about this as I, I came upon this question was... I'm not sure anybody's going to want to hear this today, you know. And nobody wants to talk about forgiveness. But there may be somebody here this morning who's carrying the, the burden of a serious wrong that has been done to you. Maybe it was even this last week or um, this past year or in years gone by. And, and if that is your situation today, then, then I want to share with you that this parable is for you um, and this question that is asked. But let me also go ahead and say forgiveness, um, this forgiveness thing is a hard thing to deal with, right? Um, somebody said forgiveness is an easy subject to talk about, but it's a different story when we have something to forgive. Um, or somebody else said forgiveness is always harder than the sermons make it out to be. <laughs> uh, Hypothetical forgiveness is always easier than actual forgiveness, right? So uh, let me go ahead and as we get ready to begin to share that this really is a spirit thing. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to have to deal with this in our lives. Right, because he's the only one that can cut through whatever scar tissue there is and, and get deep enough to deal with the real heart of the matter. So I, I want to read this passage. We'll look at this question, Jesus' answer, and hopefully um, find some, some clarity and some help in that. So I'm going to start reading here in chapter 18, 
verse 21. Stand with me. Let me read from the Word of God. Um, So Peter comes to Jesus and he said, Lord, how often, so here's the question, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And and Jesus said, I'm not telling you up to seven times, but rather 70 times seven. See, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle the accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and everyone, everything that he had so the payment could be made. And the servant fell down and said, Master, have patience with me and I'll pay it all back. Well, the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Well, that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and he took him by the throat and he said, pay me what you owe me. So this fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him and said, have patience with me and I will pay it all back. Same thing that he said, but he wouldn't do it. And so he went and he threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they, they were very grieved and they came and they told the master all that had happened. And the master, after he called him, said, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just like I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. And so my heavenly Father also will do to each of you from his heart, if, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I, again, I thank you for all the things we've heard this morning, the spirit of this service. And I pray that there would be just, your Holy Spirit would just cover us and infiltrate our hearts today. Lord, this is a hard passage of Scripture. It's hard to explain. It's hard to receive. It's hard to do. So I pray that you would just reveal your truth, that you would enable us by your Spirit. And Father, that You would show us what we need to to see today. Because we are needy people, and we are just so grateful for what you have done for us in Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, let me give you the context as we get going here today, and that is... In verse 15, Jesus had been talking with his disciples about how to respond to an offending party within the family of believers. In other words, what should you do if somebody sinned against you? And so what Jesus does is he gives this spiritual protocol for how that ought to be handled within um, the fellowship of believers. And that's what prompted Peter to ask the question that he does in verse 21. And, and you hear what he's asking, really. He's asking, Lord, what is, the, what is the limit on forgiveness, right? Surely, uh, surely there's a point where we get to draw the line, isn't there? I mean, we, 
How many times do we have to forgive somebody? And then, then he goes on to even give Jesus a suggestion in case he doesn't know. Peter offers up seven as a good answer. And, and that really was, that sounds like a spiritual answer, doesn't it? Seven times because the going rate for forgiveness in that day was three. So uh, the, the rabbinic teaching was this. It, um, if somebody sinned against you, you were obligated to forgive them. And then if they sinned against you again, you had to forgive them again. And if they did it a third time, you forgive them the third time. And in a precursor of baseball, they decided three strikes and you're out. Right? Right? So that's all you had to do three times, and, and the person, uh, you could go ahead and get even with them. You could do whatever you wanted to do because you had fulfilled your obligation. So Peter's thinking, okay, what about seven? Seven is twice as many of three as three. Seven is a perfect number. So, man, that's a perfect forgiveness number, right? If you just forgive somebody seven times, right? Jesus and Jesus, Peter wasn't ready for the answer that Jesus gave. He said, no, 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 more like 70 times 7. 490 times? Peter's trying to figure all of that out. And he said, how in the world will you keep count? I mean, that, that's almost like you'd have to always forgive somebody. And, of course, that's exactly what Jesus was saying, right? And so he follows up his answer to Peter with this parable, this story. And he says, Peter, you remember that I have taught you that you ought to seek first the kingdom of God. Yes, sir. Well, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And so he, he begins to tell him this story. And he said, There's the, it's like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants and when he had begun to settle accounts one was brought to him owing him 10,000 talents now let's stop there because this is important a talent a talent was a um, an amount of money it was a denomination of money and it, it equaled to approximately 6,000 denarii you probably heard that, denarius. We talked about that before. A, de, a denarius was basically a day's wages, right? Somebody would do work, they'd get paid for the day, one denarius. So you do the math here. If a talent is 6,000 denarii, 10,000 talents times 6,000 denarii, that's 60 million days worth of work. Now, you go on a little bit further just so you can understand that. If you worked six days a week, rested on one, that's just basically 192,000 years you'd have to work, right? It's about what a tank of gas costs today. No, no, seriously. 10,000 talents was such an astronomical amount of money that it was ludicrous to think this guy could ever pay it back. I mean, Peter probably laughed and rolled his eyes when Jesus mentioned that amount of money. Nobody could get out from under that kind of debt. And that was exactly Jesus' point. See, this man owed a debt that he could not possibly ever repay. Now, verse 23, he was going to take everything that the man had. Well, that's what they did in Roman culture, right? They would um, garnish everything that he had, his servants, his wife, his family, whatever it was. And, and, and the man who was owed the money may not get everything back, but, but at least he would get something. Plus, he would send a message to whomever else owed him money, right? So uh, look at verse 26. It says, a servant fell down and said, have patience with me and I will pay it all. I will pay you all of that. Well, how in the world was he going to do that? I mean, to even think that he could pay that kind of debt was craziness. He, he was just fooling himself. There's no way. And the king knew there was no way. That's why the king did what he did in verse 27. 
So the questions that come up are, how in the world could somebody owe that much? Even more, the question would be, how in the world could somebody be that generous and that forgiving to forgive that debt? But Jesus said, that's what the kingdom of God's like. Now, do you see the parallel? Right? That that servant is us? that we owe an unpayable moral and spiritual debt, that there is no way in eternity that, that we could satisfy that debt on our own. And for us to think we could ever work that off, it, it would be like this guy thinking he was going to be able to pay back 10,000 talents. It was hopeless. It was an impossible situation. And if this king did not show mercy, this man had absolutely no hope, there'd be no forgiveness of that debt. Well, what Peter didn't grasp and didn't understand at that time was that Jesus was getting ready to satisfy that debt. He was going to pay that sin debt for us. Now, here's the thing. We're not going to understand the rest of the parable if we don't get a hold of this first part. So we need to be reminded this morning of the debt from which we've been forgiven, right? It's not, like, it's not like we owed a debt that we could repay if we were ever just given a chance because we're not good enough, we're not disciplined enough, we're not moral enough to do that. We have this sin nature inside of us that put us in this position, and spiritually speaking, 10,000 talents doesn't do justice to what we owe. It's more like 10,000 times 10,000 talents. Tim Keller says we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we dared hope. And my dear friends, we should celebrate that today, right? We were all 10,000 talent debtors, but the king didn't just forgive our debt. He paid it himself. Amen? Thank you. Okay, then we can move on to part two. We got to get part one before we can get part two, right? So you get to part two in verses 28 to 34, and, and we're asking a completely different question now, right? No longer are we asking, how can somebody forgive like that? Now we're asking, how can somebody who has been forgiven so much show such little forgiveness to others? I mean, you think when this guy came up to him, he would be head over heels generous in light of what had just been given to him, but he's not. He is petty, he is unforgiving, he is stingy with his grace. Well, the others see that. They're grieved by what they see. Word gets back to the king. The king calls the servant in and says, you don't get it, do you? You thought grace meant that I would be a pushover and that you could receive my kindness, but you could selfishly deny that to someone else. You were glad to receive my grace, but you didn't want to show any grace yourself. That's not how it works in this kingdom. Those who receive grace are called to give grace. See, that word forgiveness, just it means to let go, to send away. It, it, actually, the word can mean to cancel a debt. It's letting go of hard feelings toward a person, even though you may have a right to feel that way. It's letting go of the debt that you believe that person owes you for what they've done. See, and so forgiveness is taking that debt of their offense and releasing them from it. One man, Dr. Archibald Hart, said, forgiveness is when I give up the right to hurt you for hurting me. You see why I say there's nothing easy about forgiveness? 
I mean, that's part of the reason Peter asked what he does. Lord, is there, there's got to be a limit to this. This is too hard. Truth be told, we like getting even, right? Don't we? We do. We, I mean, we go to movies. We love the movies where there's a bad guy and a good guy, right? And truthfully, we would typically not go to a movie where the good guy forgives the bad guy, right? We want him to blow him up. And the bigger the explosion, the better. Solomon knew how hard this forgiveness thing was. He said in Proverbs 18, 19, A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And contentions are like bars of a castle. In other words, we just don't seem to do forgiveness well on our own. And if we're like Peter, we want to have limits to our forgiveness. So, so let me give the points today. Um, number one, in Christ, God has forgiven us a personal sin debt that was over overwhelmingly impossible for us to pay. Right? Jesus didn't just take care of a debt that you could have taken care of if you had enough time. No. No, you, there's no way in the world you can do that. It is a debt we cannot pay. And because of that, we do deserve that prison, that eternal separation from God. We deserve death and hell. But in Christ, God has forgiven us of a personal sin debt that was overwhelmingly impossible for us to pay. Secondly, as Christians, we have a spiritual responsibility to forgive others. Because we have been forgiven. C.S. Lewis said, To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Now, we don't come to faith in Christ and receive this extraordinary gift of forgiveness and then spend the rest of our lives trying to pay it back. Friends, we cannot reimburse God for that. We're called to spend the rest of our lives celebrating that kindness by loving him and following him and imitating him before the rest of the world so that he gets the glory. As he has shown us grace, we show grace to others. And that leads to the third point, and that's this. When we forgive someone, we are showing them the same grace God has shown us. Right? So we're to forgive because we have been forgiven. And we're to forgive as we have been forgiven. One answer is the should we forgive the other answers, how should we forgive? Colossians 3, 13, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Ephesians 4, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. I'm not sure there's a, I'm not sure there's a quality that is more Christ-like and more Christ-honoring than forgiveness. Now, if I can, I want to take a minute and, and make something, or try to make it clear. We struggle often with what forgiveness is, and I think we also struggle with what forgiveness isn't. 
Um, so I want to list five or seven things that forgiveness is not. Um, there's a book by a guy named Lewis Smead called The Art of Forgiveness. It's a very good book. And he, he lists some of these, and, and I think they're important to understand. Forgiveness is not denying that we've been hurt or pretending that the hurt is no big deal. It is. It is a big deal. And if you've ever been hurt by somebody, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So when you forgive, that's not denying that you've been hurt. It's not pretending that everything, you know, that the hurt wasn't a big deal to you. Secondly, forgiveness is not justifying the other person's behavior. You're not justifying what they did by your forgiving them. And right along with that, it doesn't mean the other person wasn't wrong. We think that to forgive them means that they weren't wrong. They may assume or somebody may assume we thought they, they didn't do anything wrong. No, that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness doesn't mean putting yourself or others back into an abusive situation. And forgiveness doesn't mean that it never comes to mind again. Um, wouldn't that be great that you never thought about it again? I mean, you get hurt deeply and then it never comes up in your heart, never bubbles up in your heart again. That'd be great. And forgiveness doesn't mean there isn't need for correction. I mean, that's what verse 15 is saying, right? That's what Jesus is getting to. How do you handle this? In other words, R.C. Sproul said, he, he said, if, if a fellow Christian steals your wallet, you have every right to go to him and say, you've wronged me. Give me back my wallet. Okay? And, and then lastly, forgiveness doesn't always lead to restoration. Forgiveness doesn't always lead to restoration. Don't we wish that it did? One man, one theologian said, really when you think about it, there are two ways, or two, he said two kinds of forgiveness. The one, the first one is a willingness to forgive. It, it, in other words, you have a merciful heart towards somebody who has wronged you, but they haven't repented. So you can't restore the relationship on your own. You can't bring them to repentance, but you can release the debt. And then that other forgiveness is when that person does repent and seeks forgiveness. That's the, the, that's the forgiveness of reconciliation. So then we get down to verses 35, 34, and 35, and, and they're very difficult. I'm not going to stand here and tell you, oh, those are so easy. But let me just share um, what I believe is saying. Number one, it's just really a graphic expression um, or a way of expressing the accountability of people who have received grace in the way they're to show grace. James 2, verse 13 says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Dr. N.T. Wright said, Forgiveness is a way of life, God's way of life. God's way to life. And then he writes, if you lock up the piano because you don't want to play to someone else, how can God play to you? Now, I, I, this is a parable. This is, this is a story. So we have to be careful in how we interpret it. I think Jesus is pointing to the, the human logic of an earthly ruler that when he saw the unforgiveness of the one that he had forgiven, he would have been appalled. Our justice-oriented mindset would 
think that that guy needs to be punished for that. That's what we would expect. But, but don't read in here more than is here because Jesus is not saying that God is capricious and whimsical and indecisive about forgiving people and that he'd forgive and then unforgive. But there's nothing illogical about a loving father who would discipline his eternally forgiven children for refusing to reflect his grace in how they treat others. You see, if, if we don't get anything else out of it, then let's just get this, that forgiveness, as difficult as, as it is, is a serious thing to God. It's a serious thing to God. It's a huge issue. And we think that, oh, whether we forgive somebody or not, or we hold a grudge, or we get bitter, that, that's just a moral choice. It's a personal moral choice. But Jesus says that is a spiritual choice. To forgive is the Christ-like choice. But if it is a choice, then somewhere we have to accept that forgiveness is not a prisoner of our emotions. It is a servant of our will. And I started thinking about this, and I started thinking, how do, how do we... How do we respond to this? And I thought there really there are however many. I'm going to give four ways to respond to this because there are some of us this morning, we need to remember that we are 10,000 talent forgiven people. That there is a debt that we could not pay that Christ has paid for us. Paid in full. I thought of Matt Redman's song and I, where he says, for all your greatness, I will keep on singing. Why? 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. And I'm thinking, well, here's 10,000 talents, 10,000 reasons that we have to praise and thank God and to express our gratitude for what he has done for us in Christ. A debt we could not pay, he paid. Then there are those that might not have ever experienced God's forgiveness. And, and forgiveness is hard for you because you've never experienced that forgiveness. And so the invitation today is for you to open your heart and to receive a 10,000 talent forgiveness. That all of your sin, all of your indebtedness paid at the cross by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And you find that forgiveness and that freedom when you come to faith in him. And then there's another group I thought of this morning, and there are probably some people who understand the 10,000 talent indebtedness. You just can't understand how somebody could forgive you of such sin and such a debt. And you just think, I know me. I, I don't understand how anybody could do that. And, and maybe today you just need to accept what Christ has done for you by faith understand that he has forgiven you that the cross was not simply a partial payment for sin and then lastly there's this group that has been forgiven and yet for whatever reason you can't find it in your heart to forgive and you're holding on to bitterness and anger and stress I 
I think maybe those are the torturers the scripture speaks of here. That are just in your life and you've not been willing to let go of that. And because you haven't been willing to let go of that, it's not let go of you. And so today you just need to accept again and, and think about what God has done for you in Christ. And allow that to permeate your life so much so that you find the freedom to show that forgiveness to someone else. We forgive because we've been forgiven and we forgive as we have been forgiven. So I ask if you would bow your heads with me this morning. And maybe you just need to rejoice this morning and thank God for the forgiveness that you find in Christ that your sin debt has been paid. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we need to relish in that forgiveness. And maybe today you need to um, open your heart and receive Christ because you've been living in this eye for an eye world and you've been eat up with bitterness and you need to find forgiveness and healing and life in Christ just call on him whoever calls upon the name of the Lord see Jesus said that the Son did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So would you receive that today? Or maybe... You just need to ask God by his Holy Spirit to break through in your heart and give you a spirit of forgiveness. And that you would learn to forgive because and as you have been forgiven. Father, I do pray that there would be a spirit of forgiveness that just covers this place. Personal forgiveness in our own lives as we recognize what you have done for us. But also a spirit of forgiveness toward one another. Somebody that has wronged us and hurt us and it's painful and we don't even want to do seven times, Lord. We don't even want to do three. We can't even imagine once. Fill us with a spirit of forgiveness. Fill us with your grace so that it overflows and that we give you 
whatever rights we think we would have because it belongs to you. You'll take care of it. And let us glorify you in an attitude and a spirit of grace and forgiveness. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today. Melt us, mold us, fill us, and use us. For your glory, by your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I am so thankful for the forgiveness that we find in Christ. Amen. May we live it. May we show it every day. If you have a decision today that you would say, Pastor, I want to know more. I prayed to receive Christ. Please let me know. Let House know. If you're on, if you're watching online, just fill out uh, that response on our website. We just want to be able to encourage you and pray with you you want to know more about what it means to be a part of Southern Crescent and and the church family here, let us know. We would love to answer those questions as well. But it is good to be with you, just to be able to open God's Word and even look at the hard stuff together, right? So, um, and we rejoice with these students, every one of them, for the way God spoke to their heart and will continue to do so as those seeds were planted in this last week. But we're glad to be able to welcome you here. Um, I'm sure I miss from time to time all of this, but we just want to wish Cliff and Beverly Lawrence a happy 68th anniversary today. And uh, yeah, but um, Make our guests feel at home. Make them feel welcome. Just encourage one another in the Lord as we leave this place. House, anything else? Susan? All right. We're going to sing? All right. Let's stand together as we prepare to go.